All right, I know that this is really overdue. I'm a little bit tardy on my Karen homework, but um, when I finished the actual prep, it was 53 slides in length. And just the mental idea of dealing with Karen for 53 slides was really hard work. So I'm gonna break this video up. We're gonna do part of it today and then we'll do part of it another week, but we are gonna keep making progress because we are gonna finish this fucking book. Karen's chapter is on the enlightenment, sort of. Um, you know, we're, I think you should probably have a feel now for this idea that she starts a chapter with a kind of a clear idea and then loses the plot and kind of goes off into really weird areas and doesn't connect things up. And the first part of the book, or the chapter, I should say, is not that incoherent, which is why I'm gonna get through it first. And we're gonna do that and then we'll deal with the rest of the chapter another time. The... There's a lot of different themes that are happening here in Karen's um, enlightenment chapter. So part of it has to do with the changing mentality and her views on the changing mentality of 16th and 17th century Europe, the way that people were starting to think about the world vis-a-vis -vis the supernatural. And so a lot of this chapter is taken up with that transition from the thinking things are magic, to actually relying on reason and observation to inform you what the world is like. And yeah, you can imagine that Karen isn't going to take too kindly to this. By the end of the 16th century, she writes, the West had embarked on a process of technicalization that would produce an entirely different kind of society and a new ideal of humanity. Inevitably, this would affect its perception on the role and nature of God. I'm just going to quibble that Karen is saying by the end of the 16th century, which is like 50, 1599, but really the Enlightenment is seen as happening closer to, I'm sorry, I have to delay my slide here, um, the beginning of the 18th century or the middle of the 17th century are used as approximate starting points. So again on history, history fail. She goes on to say, because no other society had ever achieved anything similar. The West created problems that were entirely new and therefore very difficult to deal with. The process of Westernization had begun, and with it, the cult of secularism that claimed independence of God. Cult of secularism? Fuck you, Karen. On page 344, she writes, The process of modernization involved the West in a series of profound changes. It led to industrialization and a consequent transformation of agriculture, an intellectual enlightenment, and political and social revolutions. Naturally, these immense changes affected the way men and women perceived themselves and made them revise their relationship with the ultimate reality that they traditionally called God. And again, we have Karen just making up what God is, right? Is God the ultimate reality that people have, you know, have a relationship with? Or is it a subjective creation of their own imagination done internally? It always depends on what she needs. Karen then sums up various things that characterized the Enlightenment, such as specialization, the emergence of scientists, the notion of capital and the rise of capitalism, literacy rates rising, the idea of mass markets, and the bourgeoisie, this new economic class. Specialists in the various sciences were encouraged to pool their findings to aid this process. Instead of keeping their discovery secret, the new scientific institutions wanted to disseminate knowledge in order to advance future growth in their own and other fields. The one thing that science that is actually vital for science is the sharing of information. When people try to hide things and claim it as their own and keep it secret, that's when knowledge fails to get passed on. And so the idea of science being open and transparent and encouraging people to come in and question it that is the transformation of the mind that characterizes to my my mind the difference between the enlightenment and everything that had gone on before when knowledge becomes something that is open for everyone and everyone should be getting the same answers when they are doing the experiments or investigating it because reality should be consistently appearing to all of us in the same way um, that to me is the real tr transformation from magic-based thinking to reality-based thinking. She then, like usual, makes assertions about what men who've been dead for 300 or 400 years thought. It followed that every major intellectual saw himself less as a conserver of tradition than as a pioneer. 
He was an explorer like the navigators who had penetrated to new parts of the globe. Talking shit. There was a new optimism about humanity as control over the natural world, which had once held mankind in thrall, appeared to advance in leaps and bounds. People began to believe that better education and improved laws could bring light to the human spirit. Karen again is combining this notion of people and men and women with political elites. She doesn't know what average people were thinking in 1599 or 1602. She knows what some men who wrote things down might have been thinking at one point in time. So again, this tendency of hers to over egg the pudding when it comes to inferring from what one person says to what a generation or an entire continent was thinking is total bullshit. Now I'm going to, in this next bit, Karen makes assertions that I think are unwarranted based on what she's written in previous chapters. She writes, the new scientific spirit was empirical, based solely on observation and experiment. The old proofs for God's existence were no longer entirely satisfactory, and natural scientists and philosophers, full of enthusiasm for the empirical method, felt compelled to verify the objective reality of God in the same way as they proved other demonstrable phenomena. Well, clearly the old proofs were never satisfactory because people kept having to come up with new ones or take up the old proofs and explain what was wrong about them and try to, you know, create a new one. So again, this is just a, a narrative that she wants to create about the old world passing away and this whole new approach to God coming up when I don't think it's as clear cut as she would present it. As Karen is wont, she just goes through a series of individuals who thought things about God as her history of God. She discusses Blaise Pascal and eventually she talks about Pascal's wager. She writes about Pascal, Faith, he insisted, was not a rational assent based on common sense. It was a gamble. It was impossible to prove God existed, but equally impossible for reason to disprove his existence. It's impossible to disprove that there's a pixie on my shoulder right now. This is, again, Karen doing like false dichotomies. From Pascal, she moves on to Descartes and Descartes' attempt to establish an equally analytic demonstration of God's existence. And Descartes basically says, I, you know, he fails to, to demonstrate that God must exist. Our experience of doubt therefore, tells us that a supreme and perfect being, God, must exist. And, you know, Descartes fails because he assumes the thing that he wants to establish exists. Unlike his other more rigorous questioning of his perceptions, when it comes to God, he doesn't rigorously question that idea of God. Just to give you an idea how weak-ass this is, I'm going to give you a slight summary, a short summary of Descartes' argu ontological argument from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Descartes basically said, I have an idea of a supremely perfect being, a being that has all perfections. Necessary existence is a perfection, therefore a supremely perfect being exists. Both Hume and Kant have critiqued and criticized Descartes' uh, arguments thoroughly, and his version of the ontological argument is now indefensible. Karen really does not like Isaac Newton. Mm -mm 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 -mm. She characterizes his worldview in this way. The English physicist Isaac Newton, who also reduced God to his own mechanical system, was equally anxious to rid Christianity of mystery. In truth, Newton began with an attempt to explain the physical, physical universe and with God as an essential part of it. And I'm not really going to get into Karen's summary of Newton's theology, mostly because it's not important. But I do want to point out how she just makes shit up as she goes. Taking a little uh, hydration break here because talking about this much bullshit makes you thirsty. All right, let's get ready for Karen and her trash talking. Newton had clearly no understanding of the role of mystery in the religious life. For a scientist like Newton, however, it was very difficult to cultivate such an attitude in science, people were learning that they had to be ready to scrap the past and start again from first principles in order to find the truth. Religion, however, like art, often consists of a dialogue with the past in order to find a perspective from which to view the present. Tradition provides a jumping off point, which enables men and women to engage with the perennial questions about the ultimate meaning of life. Religion and art, therefore, do not work like science. 
This struck me as slightly odd because having plowed through Karen's bullshit and having to read it out loud, that sounded like a, the complete opposite of what she'd said earlier in the book. So I went back and I looked and look what I found. On page 205, she writes, Science demands the fundamental belief that there is a rational explanation for everything. It also requires an imagination and courage, which is not dissimilar to religious creativity. Like the prophet or the mystic, the scientist also forces himself to confront the dark and unpredictable realm of uncreated reality. So which is it? Is science not dissimilar to religious creativity? Or are art and religion um, something that are not at all like science? With Karen, it depends on what her needs are, because she's making the stuff up as she goes. We also see Karen review what I see are the first seeds of biblical scholarship, that is actually reading the text critically rather than with a mind of how, how can I be more credulous and believe this bullshit without questioning it, um, in the Enlightenment period. As these radical ideas spread to the continent, a new breed of historians began to examine church history objectively. It was disturbing for many of the faithful to see that fundamental dogmas about the nature of God and Christ had developed over the centuries and were not present in the New Testament. Did that mean they were false? And on Remaris, Remaris argued that Jesus had simply wanted to found a godly state, and when his messianic mission had failed, he had died in despair. He pointed out that in the Gospels, Jesus never claimed that he had come to atone for the sins of mankind. That idea, which had become central to Western Christianity, could only be traced back to St. Paul, the true founder of Christianity. And in my opinion, he was right. Now, uh, Karen's going to do some whining, and I'm going to get her some grapes and cheese to go along with it. These objective studies depended upon a literal understanding of the scripture and ignored the symbolic or metaphorical nature of the faith. One might object that this kind of criticism was as irrelevant as it might be to art or poetry. Yeah, hiding behind art or poetry, again, because your bullshit ideas can't withstand some investigation. Very typically, Karen. First of all, it's a, it's a bullshit charge. It's not necessary to read the texts literally in order to read them in a scholarly manner. And, you know, I can see Matthew's bullshit myth-making um, and how it's for his Jewish readers, which is very different from the kind of bullshit that Luke is peddling in Acts about, let's say, the propaganda for how well the apostles got along after the death of Jesus. I mean, you don't have to read them literally. And Karen, of course, makes this sort of straw man argument because dealing with the reality of scholarship is too hard. And secondly, if you know, this whole sort of criticizing the text, religious text is like criticizing poetry. Well, art and poetry are just made up. There's no reality there. So if what you're saying is true, if religion is like that, then religion is just made up as well. It's just based on your subjective personal feelings, your cultural conditions, and, you know, the circumstances of by accident, what country you were born in to what religion you were born in. There's no truth in it. And if that's what she's saying, then she should just come out and say that. Western Christians were now committed to a literal understanding of their faith and had taken an irrevocable step back from myth. A story was either factually true or it was a delusion. Again, bullshit. This idea that literalism only emerged in the Enlightenment or just before it is like contradicted by the way that people saw, you know, Galileo wasn't imprisoned, you know, because people uh, were, had a mythical view of the creation story. He was in, like, put on under house arrest because they had a literal view of it. There's no evidence that people read it anything other than literally, except a few highly educated people like Philo and, and maybe, um, oh, which one was it? Was it um, Augustine? Yeah, Aquinas is later. So Augustine might have been seeing some of these ideas metaphorically or symbolically because they were highly educated men. But you need education to see things mythically. And when 95% of the population is illiterate, uneducated, uh, credulous and superstitious, the idea that nobody took these stories literally, I just find it to be bullshit. All right, so that's going to be, I'm going to take a break. That's enough, Karen, for one day. Um, but we're going to get back into the Enlightenment in the next video. Don't know when that's going to be, but I do want to finish this book before the one year anniversary. So at least, if nothing else, we're going to get done by September. 
Thanks for your patience waiting for this video. I hope you're enjoying the other things I'm bringing out. I'm bringing out lots of stuff uh, on my channel when I first started this channel. Should we have a little chat? Let's have a little chat. All right, so end of the video. If you don't want to watch the rest of this, you don't have to. Um, you know, when I started out my channel, um, I guess, you know, in, in September of last year, I was like, okay, I'm going to make six videos a month. I'm going to have four on the book series and then two, like maybe an Atheist Asks or other kind of fun ones that I'll drop in. And wow, that just changed. I'm um, doing just videos all the time now. I've got Facepalm Moments. I've got the Secular TV bit, which goes both on my channel and on the Secular TV channel. I've got the book to finish. I, I just did another um, Atheist Asks interview with the Godless Geezer, which was really a lot of fun and I think a really good video. I, if you haven't seen it, please check it out. And more to do. I mean, I, I don't have enough time to do all the videos that are in my head. And uh, so that's, it's just kind of funny how it's grown. Um, but it is certainly the case that Karen is more work than almost any of my videos because I have to usually read her three times, the chapter through three times in order to first process it and then to distill it and then to prepare it for here. And then I still have to talk to you guys about it. So I go through it like four times at least, which gets to be a lot. But um, I think I'm going to take a break from the book series and just focus on more fun videos for a while. But when we do come back, it won't be on a book by Karen Armstrong. All right, well, um, hey, if you don't know already, I've got my Patreon thing. You can check that out in the um, D box below if you want to hang out and talk about the historical Jesus. All right, off to do another video before the end of the day so I can get fit this in. Um, until next time on A Different Atheist Reads, I've been Christy, you've been awesome, and thanks so much for stopping by. Please like, please share, please comment if you have some comments. Appreciate all of them. Thank you. Bye.